I'm a feminist, but when my goddaughter and I were swapping aphorisms, if you will, she told me, after I took her to see Pinocchio, that money can't buy you love. And I replied, yes, eight-year-old goddaughter, but it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich person as it is to fall in love with a poor person. (laughs) And then I was quite pleased with myself because I hadn't been heteronormative. (laughs) I did backpedal and tell her that wasn't a good message, that I was just sort of, you know, "Mm, but yeah, I thought just what came to me, and I thought, no, it's not a good... (laughs) It's not a good message. I mean, you didn't tell her not to fall in love with a poor person. No, I didn't. I just said it's just as easy. Actually, it isn't. It isn't. Has anyone been out with someone and you think, God, my life would be so much easier if I could love you? <laughs> I just can't bring myself. Has anyone else? Has anyone been out with someone like that where you just go, oh, you've got a big house and oh, it'd be really nice, but I just can't keep doing this because you're so annoying. <laughs> Has anyone? Anyone? Yes, you have? You have? Are you now with a poor person? Um, I'm with no one. You're now with no one? Wow, you've basically said, even though you've got this big house, I'd rather be with no one than you. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but when my boyfriend asked me if I needed anything from the shops, and for the first time ever, I asked him to buy me tampons, I was floored that his reaction was, yeah, fine, what kind do you want? <laughs> like, just couldn't believe that it was a non-issue for him. You thought he was going to... I like, thought he was going to freak out about it, and he was like, yeah, what, what do you need? What type? Aww. Yeah. He's a keeper. He is. <laughs> is he a rich person? <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, but he just uh, got nominated for Best Cinematographer oh. for his first ever film, so he's going to be rich. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, I invested early. Got, you got in while he was going cheap. Yeah. Well done. I'm a feminist, but once when I was having a glycolic peel, I ended up in a debate with the doctor administering it and explained to her why no woman should need to do this that I'm doing now and that it was the patriarchy's fault that I was doing it. <laughs> I basically schooled her in feminism while she was putting burning acid on my face. But I, I, I will tell you, when she showed me the mirror at the end, because it's, it's really quick, because they can't leave it on for long because of the damage it would do. Uh, <laughs> but it was so quick. But then at the end, I looked into the mirror and I went, oh my God, because I looked nine years old. <laughs> and I said to her, do other people know about this? <laughs> it's miraculous. And she went, it's a thing people don't talk about, but the glycolic peel. Is, it's not like, is that like a chemical peel? Is yeah. that what it is? Does it's, it hurt? It's, it's not like bad it chemicals, though. It's like fruit chemicals. <laughs> it's harmless. That nothing. if they leave on for too long, it causes damage. I mean, of course, but you could say that about anything. <laughs> do one. I'm a feminist, but when I was walking down the street with my boyfriend and he was speaking, he noticed I didn't hear what he said. And then he followed my eye line and looked at me so upset and just goes, you weren't paying attention to me because you were staring at that woman's boobs. And I was like, no, I wasn't. I definitely wasn't staring. Yes, you were. I could see you were staring at that woman. No, I definitely wasn't staring at... You were. I could see you staring at her boobs. And I was like, they were great boobs. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's such an odd conversation to have with your boyfriend. (laughs) Complete reverse gender. Yeah. I think that kind of is feminist in a kind of weird, it, it, flipped way. I wish I'd been behind you like a stranger <laughs> listening to that. I would have recorded it. I'm a feminist. I'm a feminist. But if John Ham asked me if he could... <laughs> but if John Ham asked me if he could have my podcast, I'd probably say, for how long? <laughs> I'd give it to John Hamm for a limited window. Sure. What if one week you turned up to see The Guilty Feminist and John Hamm just came out and I just wasn't there? <laughs> and he was just like, I'm a feminist, but I played Don Draper, famous <laughs> misogynist and womanizer. 
love me. <laughs> I mean, I would be here. The thing is, I would be here. If that ever happens, I'm in the audience. I'm in the front row. <laughs> Look for me in the front row. I'll probably be in a baseball cap and sunglasses, but I'll just be looking up in adoration. Oh. <laughs> I am a feminist, but when my boyfriend was still mad at me for staring at a woman's boobs on the street and not listening to what he had to say... My argument was, well, what do you want from me? She was wearing a bright shirt and no bra, so clearly she wanted me to look at her boobs. <laughs> wow. So is it still feminist? Yeah, no. <laughs> you seriously crossed a line, I'm glad. Yeah, it's yeah. over. <laughs> Live from the National Park. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Have you had a guilty week or a feminist week, Abigail? Uh, I had a feminist week because I did your new material night. Oh, yes, you did. Material night. And now I am doing this podcast and last night which never happens in stand-up comedy. I went to an open mic. That happens all the time. Uh, that was all women. Oh. And it wasn't for breast cancer or It wasn't anything. for breast cancer. It was just, <laughs> it was it just was an open mic. So it was like people of all different levels trying out different material. So lots of new female comedians. Yeah. It was... Oh, my God. It was a room full of women making women laugh, and it was great. I love that. That is so exciting, because normally if you, there's another woman on the bill... You don't recognise them. Like, there's one woman allowed on every one. Mm. And, I mean, usually no women, to be fair. So, actually, female comedians don't know each other very well, and they love coming on this show because they're like, oh, I get to work with another woman. Yeah. But recently, I was talking to a movie star. Don't go on about her. <laughs> and she said the same thing. She said she's producing her own films now, so she gets to work with women of her generation. Because she said, you know, if you look... I don't know, name a male movie star. Matt Damon. Matt Damon. He's a great example. He's worked with George Clooney. He's worked with Brad Pitt. He's worked with Ben Affleck, obviously, but he's done a bunch of movies all with his contemporaries. But if you think of Catherine Zeta-Jones, actually, what other women has she been in a movie with or at least shared scenes with? Because there's usually only one woman allowed. Uh, so we're talking about pushing back today. Pushing back, like not just sort of lying down and taking it, like standing up and, you know, sometimes you push and then you get sort of not the response you wanted. Like you, you assert yourself as a feminist for women everywhere. And you find you don't get the response you want and you feel a bit flattened and then you don't try again for a while. So this is about pushing back when the answer's no. Now, there is a history with the suffragettes in this building. Does anyone know what that history is? A slashed painting. Abigail, do you know any more about it than that? Uh, it was a slash. Uh, one of the suffragettes came in and slashed a painting, and then they banned women from the National Portrait Gallery. Yeah, and other galleries as well. Women were not allowed to go in unchaperoned. Uh, so they then had to have a George. If you're, list <laughs> if you're listening at home, you won't know George, but in the warm-up, George was very handy. Uh, why was I talking to George then? Uh... <laughs> Because uh, if uh, I wanted oh, yes. to go into the national, you would need board, George. I would need George to come in with come you, come in with me, to make sure you didn't slash, slash anything. Pain yeah, make slash anything with all of my sharp things that yeah. I carried under and my. A gusset. lot of women were very angry with the suffragettes because they were like, "Bloody hell, I can't go to a gallery now. I just wanted to have a little wander down to the Tate." And now I'm screwed because of you. I don't even want the vote. A lot of women felt like that. They felt like, I've got influence, I've got... Eh. We always think it was all women. But as always with radical movements, it's not all anything. A lot of people are much more comfortable with the status quo. Mm. And so this building has got a huge history with the suffragettes in as much as one of the suffragettes damaged a painting. And then this gallery Do was a little bit... I don't... I mean, is anyone... Who's in from the gallery? Who's is official here? Who, who was responsible for being patriarchal and saying women couldn't come in here anymore? The and director. The director. And what was that director's name? Presume, I'm assuming it's a man. I think it was... It might have been Holmes. Holmes. As in Sherlock. Yeah. Oh. It was Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I don't think it was. I'm going to go... I I'm not a history buff, but I'm going to go out on a limb. And say, so wasn't Sherlock Holmes. It wasn't Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes's brother... Nigel Holmes. Nigel Holmes. 
said, no more women in here. Thank you very much. Please and thank you. Which was a patriarchal act, really, wasn't it? It was. And I, I just, out of curiosity, do we know what portrait she slashed? Yes. What was it? Thomas Carlyle. He had it coming. <laughs> why, do you know why, Fiona, do you want to come up? Oh, there we go. You can come up if you want. Okay, pick it up for Fiona. Okay, Fiona, up you come. Come take a seat here. Do you know the name of the person who slashed? Yes, but I've forgotten. Okay, did, one did, second. Did, I... I'm just going to pre-announce our guest. I'm just going to say, because it's the wonderful Anita Anand. <laughs> and she's in the front row. So, Anita, do you know the name of the woman who slashed the painting? I'm going to... Is it, did it, did it someone on the tip of my tongue? It's and someone. I, 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 but I, I, brain a, Fritz, I can't remember the name. Margaret, really, who, and she was a chess master. She was a chess, chess master. master. Yeah. And she just came in, did a bit of the old slashing. Why did she... I hope she did it with the queen. Like, the chess piece. <laughs> Why did she choose him? I think it was probably random. Oh, I want more than that. I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> I want some really brilliant... Because he was a manifestation was, of the patriarchy. He was a manifestation of the patriarchy. But she just basically went, I've seen too many pictures of men in here. Yes. So I've had enough. There weren't many women in those days. No. Mm. No, well, there were fewer women, statistically. Yes, exactly. In 1919... <laughs> what year did she slash the picture? 1913. 1913. As we know, there were only 12 women yes. <laughs> living, living in Britain and, and yes. 62 worldwide. Uh, that was how it was then and actually you know you give us the vote and then we're everywhere mm. <laughs> that's what's happened yes. and that picture is now can be seen it can be seen as can a photograph of it slashed so you have it fixed photograph. like you got a little cello tape on you it now you can see it you can if you look closely it's in room 22 on the first floor I'm going and you can see where it's been restored that's absolutely amazing and is there anything else you want to tell us about the suffragettes in this building if we... um, muffs were banned Muffs? Muffs were banned. Yes. Because you could carry a chess piece in them to cut a painting. Yes. That's not where my or Georgia's mind went. <laughs> there we are. I mean, was Muffs were banned their official slogan in the early 20th century? <laughs> <sighs> Muffs needs a chaperone. <laughs> uh, and so, but genuinely, the, the, and if you're listening at home and you're being puerile, what Fiona is very sensibly... <laughs> As a very important person in this art gallery is talking about is the bit of fabric that goes around the hand to keep your hands warm, sort of the, the uni glove, in which you is, if you will. conceal <laughs> a meat cleaver. A meat cleaver, yeah. if you could just whip out a meat cleaver. Yeah. So was she wearing a muff when she did the de dastardly know. act? I don't know. Maybe she was. Oh, it's a, probably like the shoe bomber thing where now everyone has to take their shoes off mm. at the airport because one person unsuccessfully smuggled something into a shoe. Mm. Yeah. So no muffs. And do you know what? They haven't thought of that at airports. No. <laughs> I'm going I'm to exercise my right to wear a muff everywhere I go from now. Do you know what? Next week I'm going to come back with a muff. It's oh, spring. Yeah. I don't care. It doesn't look like spring. Yeah. I'm going to come back in with a muff just to flaunt my 21st century privilege. Um, Fiona, thank you very thank much. Bring your applause for Fiona. Hello, Guilty Feminists. I am briefly interrupting your Guilty Feminist episode of the week to tell you about our very exciting shows at the Edinburgh Festival. Now, the Guilty Feminist shows themselves are sold out, but the Guilty Feminist is partnering with Amnesty International UK to resurrect the sleeping secret policeman. Now, many of you will know that the secret policeman's ball tradition goes all the way back to the 1970s and started with Monty Python. It's carried on about twice a decade with some comedy greats that you know and love. And this is a very exciting thing that the Guilty Feminist is getting to partner with Amnesty International UK to bring to Edinburgh the Secret Policeman's podcast live at the Edinburgh Playhouse. Now, I can tell you that the bill so far, names will be added, includes me hosting Bisha Kayali, Ashling B, Kima Bob, Camilla Cleese, Jessica Foster Q, Rosie Jones, Phil Jupitus, Shappi Kosandi, Nish Kumar, Rachel Paris, Sarah Pascoe, Grace Petrie, Alison Spittle, Juliet Stevenson, Tiff Stevenson, Sindhu V and Felicity Ward, as well as Paul Sinha and Hot Brown Honey. Variety of these performers is going to be playing over two nights, 
the 24th of August and the 25th of August at 7.30 p.m. at the Edinburgh Playhouse. So if you want to get tickets for that, you can go on to guiltyfeminist.com, our site, or you can Google Edinburgh Playhouse and you'll be able to go through to tickets there at atgtickets.com. Uh, so please get your tickets now because I imagine it's going to sell out very quickly. Some more names will be added soon. It's going to be two nights. The shows will be 7.30 to quarter past 10 p.m. It's going to be an absolute extravaganza of Guilty Feminist Wonders plus Amnesty International UK. And uh, it really will be two phenomenal nights. So even if you weren't planning to come up to the Edinburgh Fringe, if you are in flying distance or railing distance or car distance, please come along to these events. They're going to be absolutely amazing. Please welcome to the stage the fabulous Deborah Francis White. <laughs> so I don't know if you saw the news story this week that Tony Robbins... He's an inspirational, a motivational speaker. Do you know the film Magnolia? And do you know Tom Cruise's character? Respect the dick! He's like that guy. <laughs> Only, I don't think he talks about dick, but, he's, but he does kind of... The subtext is respect the dick of everything he says. He basically goes around saying, you know, you can blame other people if you want. But if you're a six foot five white guy that went to an Ivy League college like me, you will believe that the rest of the world has no excuse. <laughs> He's that kind of guy. At this seminar, this is what he said about the Me Too movement. If you use the hashtag Me Too movement to try and get significance and certainty by attacking and destroying someone else, you haven't grown an ounce. All you have done is basically use a drug called significance to make yourself feel good. And then he said, I was just with someone the other day, a very famous man, very powerful man. Was it Trump? Because that's how he <laughs> describes himself. He's saying how stressed he is because he interviewed three people that day and one was a woman and two were men. The woman was better qualified, but she was very attractive. And he knew, I can't have her around. It's too big a risk. So he hired somebody else. I've had a dozen men tell me this. And so basically he said, women, you're doing yourself no favors because no one's going to hire women that he considers to be attractive because of the Me Too movement and you're using it to make yourself feel significant. A part of me is like, yes, yes, we want to be significant. I want it to be significant if I'm sexually harassed or assaulted. I want it to be significant. I want to feel significant if I have a contribution in a work setting. If I contribute something, I want it to feel significant. What's wrong with being significant? This is from a man who has like four houses and like comes onto the stage penis first going, I know all the answers and you want to feel significant. You are made of significance, you arrogant twat. <laughs> anyway, um, then there was some blowback. Um, a woman in the audience stood up and she said, excuse me, Mr. Robbins, but I think you are doing the Me Too movement a real disservice and uh, you should rethink your position because you're a very influential man and I don't think you should be saying this. So he said, put your fist up and she put her fist up and he put his hand on it. And she's very, she was, a, um, I mean, it's hard to know how small she was because he's so huge, <laughs> but relatively he looked really big and he was towering over and he's really well built as well. And he started pushing her back and walking across the floor, pushing her back. And he said, see, you're resisting me. You're resisting me and it's not working. It's not working. Basically his message, women, is resistance is futile. If a man has better upper body strength, you're fucked. And he is, of course, right about that. He was basically demonstrating this is how it happens. But, as Abigail pointed out to me when we discussed it later, what he was not really expecting was that the Me Too movement is, in fact, the antidote to one woman who can't push back. Because what happened was all the women pushed back. 
And then I imagine the meeting with his agent went something like this. You're going to have to apologize, Tony. I don't apologize to anyone. Respect the dick. <laughs> well, I'm afraid you're going to have to apologize. Why should I apologize? Because you will have literally no career. Do you like that house you have in Bel Air? I love the house in Bel Air. Do you like your Ferrari? I love the house Ferrari. You won't have any of those things unless you apologize. And it was at this point that Tony Robbins said... I apologize for suggesting anything other than my profound admiration for the hashtag Me Too movement. <laughs> Let me clearly say I agree with the goals of the hashtag Me Too movement and its founding message of empowerment through empathy, which makes it a beautiful force for good. <laughs> um, now, his apology was quite clever because it didn't say you misunderstood me. It didn't say, if you're upset, I'm sorry. Uh, it was just unequivocal. But it is, for that reason, incredibly funny. Now... <laughs> I now have a habit because I think what I'm seeing in the world is the pushback from the patriarchy. It's basically a lot of these men not realising that lunch is no longer for wimps and greed is no longer good and something is happening and their world is being shaken and they're really freaked out by it and they're really like, what do you mean? But I've never apologised in my life. And I think that's what Tony Rose said. But I just say the things I say that I don't filter and I don't think about how they land because it doesn't matter how they land because I've said them. I am the only important person and now that's not true anymore because the Me Too movement is pushing back and other forces are happening around them and they're really surprised. So my way now of dealing with men like this who continue to say things like this is I just put their voice into a Mickey Mouse voice. <laughs> so when I'm reading an article like this, I just read, If you use the hashtag MeToo movement to try and get significance and certainty by attacking and destroying someone else, you haven't grown an ounce. All you've done is basically use a drug called significance to make yourself feel good. <laughs> and then, I apologize for suggesting anything other than my profound admiration for the hashtag MeToo movement. Let me clearly say I agree with the goal of the Me Too movement and its founding message of empowerment through empathy, which makes it a beautiful force for good. Is that what an apology is? <laughs> Thank you very much. As many of you know who've been listening for the last few weeks, I've written a book called The Guilty Feminist. It's my view on feminism, 21st century feminism and guilty feminism. It's got lots of new material as well as some old favourites that people have requested. You can pre-order that book from Waterstones. Go to guiltyfeminist.com. Also, I am doing events in various areas of the country where we're having live shows and I will assign your copy of the book and do meet and greets. So please go to guiltyfeminist.com and see if there's one happening in your area. And if so, if there are still tickets left. To celebrate the release of The Guilty Feminist, uh, Waterstones is offering you the chance to win a pair of tickets to see The Guilty Feminist podcast live, a signed copy and other Guilty Feminist goodies, t-shirts, badges, etc. If you would like to know about how to go into the prize draw, you can go to waterstones.com forward slash win forward slash the hyphen guilty hyphen feminist hyphen prize hyphen draw and there's a link to that on the guilty feminist website as well if you're up in edinburgh on the 17th or the 24th of august please go and see sophie duca's wacky racists it's the bigot crushing comedy cabaret game show we had her on recently as a guest i don't think her episode's come out yet but she's absolutely brilliant and uh, her one amazing poster, which is an incredible piece of art, got cut up and defaced by somebody who I think wanted the funny cartoon of Donald Trump. And she spent a lot of money on it. So please, please, please go and see it. It's at the Bedlam Theatre, 17th and the 24th of August. Book now, 11pm. Also, go and see Kima Bob in Bob and Buds. It's amazing. She's amazing. Please check her out while you're up there. Guest today is a television and radio presenter regularly seen and heard on the BBC who has recently published a book about suffragette Princess Sophia. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful Anita Renand. Hello. Lovely to see you. 
Love to see you for now, Anisha. You have been our guest before. You were on the Palladium show on the I Suffragette can't get enough centenary. Of you guys. Yeah, I know, but we didn't have enough exclusive Anita and Anne time, so we invited you back. Now you're very knowledgeable about suffragettes, and you've done this incredibly rigorous book about Princess Sophia, which is very exciting. We have another book that we want to begin with. It's the hundred pioneering women in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, I know, it's exciting. Now, anybody who listens to The Guilty Feminist will definitely want this book on their coffee table or really in their handbag uh, <laughs> to be able to bring out and go, well, have you heard of uh, Elizabeth... Hold on. <laughs> have you heard of Elizabeth Cowell? There are just incredible portraits. So these women are not... Uh, it's not that no other women are brilliant. It's that these are women that the National Portrait Gallery has beautiful portraits of, but they are significant. And you might notice in lots of galleries, there are more paintings by men than uh, women, and lots of the women aren't wearing any clothes. And so this is portraits of significant women, and so it's a really, really beautiful book to have. Anita and Abigailia, I'm going to ask you, which women popped out of this book for you? Well, it's interesting you say that, you know, there are not many pictures by women and of women in galleries. And there's one person who is here in the portrait gallery who is both. So her name is Louisa Jopling. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture in this very, very beautiful book. She's absolutely stunning. She's sort of standing there really defiantly. And she is a stunning, stunning woman. She was also a militant suffragette. And one of the things that used to happen when the suffragettes decided they wouldn't pay taxes or they wouldn't pay fines, which they did regularly, defying the authorities, you know, send me to prison, let's see how that works for you, stuffing up the prison system with their hunger striking. One of the things that the government started doing when hunger striking was frowned upon was seizing assets. So they would barge with bailiffs into houses and take the most precious possession that a woman had and then auction them. So there would be these mass suffragette shaming auctions that would take place. And the suffragettes were just such a wonderful bunch and a wonderful bunch of defiant women. They would entirely invade the auction rooms. And Louisa was one of the people, Louise Jopling was one of the people who led these invasions. And Sophia, this happened to her, uh, the princess I wrote about, they barged into her home at Hampton Court. They took some of her most precious jewellery and they took it to be auctioned. The suffragettes filled every seat in the auction house. There were a few men, but they didn't dare open their mouths. <laughs> Not even to squeak, because they would have been just jumped on. And the bids just kept getting lower and lower. And there's a transcript of the auctioneer who is literally having an aneurysm, <laughs> trying to sell a rather beautiful brooch. And finally... It is Ms. Jopling, who is this fantastic, not only beautiful woman, the thing about her is that she's, she's also a rather wonderful portrait painter. She buys it, and then they do this whole wonderful thing. They turn the shaming, you know, this, the equivalent of putting a woman in the stocks, into a celebration, and they handed it back to Sophia, who then gives a big speech, and then cake was produced. And oh. <laughs> that sounds like the best day ever. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. There were very few laws protecting women, and particularly women who were involved in, you know, the dirty business of trying to get the vote. There were those who were very high up in government. Somebody in the Home Office actually wanted women who were prosecuted for doing any kind of criminal damage for the suffragette cause to bypass the prison system altogether and just go into a lunatic asylum. Wow. <laughs> because he said wow. they were mentally unhinged and tried to get something off the ground legislation-wise to have that actually written into law. Wow. Yeah. So she, that was a great example of a woman who pushed back. What page is she on? She's on page 72. And She's on she page 72. I feel like I want to get a second book so I can cut out... I mean, this is probably... I shouldn't say this, <laughs> but sort of put some up, frame some yeah. of these women. It, it had crossed my mind too. <laughs> oh, God. Don't buy this in order to cut it up and frame it. You shouldn't talk about cutting up pictures in the gallery. No, it's... <laughs> yeah. They're quite well, touchy well, about that should. here. It's the spirit of the suffragettes. <laughs> Abigail, have you got somebody you'd like to put forward? Yeah. This is really fun to go through because I didn't know a lot of the women in it. I found uh, Rosalind Franklin, who is a molecular biologist and chemist and X-ray. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but in 1938, despite her father's resistance, as he was against women's higher education, she attended the Newman College in Cambridge. And then she went on to be this great researcher at King's College investigating the structure of, uh, which is DNA, uh, <laughs> but the long word for it. And her research, uh, listen guys, 
Okay, I got chutzpah. I don't got smarts, okay? Uh, and that's what, well, one reason why I think she's so cool is, like, while she was there doing all this research, her uh, male colleagues, like, belittled her and uh, didn't want anything to do with her findings, and she was banned from the university dining room and the men-only pubs. But it turns out that her research that she did while she was there was a vital contribution that has been historically overlooked. We know that. Some but, people would say significant, almost like she's significant and yeah. sought significance in her work, Tony Robbins, you twat. Yeah. But her work then paved the way for uh, basically the guy who discovered the DNA strand. Her work is what led him to discover it. Mm. So when almost like she discovered it and then he took the credit probably. <laughs> well, it happens a lot in science though. When, it happens a lot. It turns out like she loosened the jar so much that the jar top was lying off. <laughs> and then he went, "Oh wow, look at this jar. It looks like I've opened it in my sleep." Well, when I'm they I'm not saying that happened here. I've no Well, I will say when they were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery, Crick Watson oh, is, yeah, know, uh, suggested yeah. that she also be awarded the Nobel Prize as well because their work would not have happened with her work. Was this what she was but already dead? She and passed can't be away, and they yeah. don't give the yeah. Nobel Prize after you've passed on. But they did acknowledge they were the only ones who did because everyone she worked with at King's College were like, get away, you're a dirty girl and you have cooties. And she was like, but I have really good research about these cooties. And like, I know why they are what they are. And they were like, yeah. My pick from this book for a woman who pushed back is Olive Elaine Morris. Um, it's an amazing photograph of her in 1973. She personifies 1973. She's incredible. Uh, she was a political activist and community leader, George. <laughs> Based in and around the countercultural hub of Brixton in London, arriving from Jamaica aged nine, uh, she was politicised in the 60s and 70s. And uh, when it's very small print, isn't it? Now I see your problem, Abigail. Yeah, Abigail. thank you, thank you. Um, when stop and search laws, discrimination in housing and employment made life extremely difficult for the African Caribbean community, and she was indefatigable in her fight. Brilliant word. She constantly pushed back. And in 1969, she received a three-month suspended sentence for interceding in a Nigerian diplomat's arrest for a parking offence. Having been racially and physically abused by the police during this incident, she joined the Revolutionary Socialist Black Panthers in the 1970s and was a founder member of the Brixton Black Women's Group. And so she was somebody who fought for racial equality and for feminism. And it's just the most incredible picture of her. And she's definitely one I'm cutting out of my alternative book. Fiona, I promise you I won't cut any out. I will. I'm going to cut them all out. Um, to be honest, when this is done, it'll just be a book with Margaret Thatcher in it. <laughs> she is in it. Um, uh, tell us about Princess of Fife. You told us a little bit in the last show that she constantly wrote to Winston Churchill. Um, yeah. So many times that he, you found a bit of paper where he'd written, never respond to this woman again, yeah. or yeah. similar. Yeah. How did she feel? Because you had to be over 30 and own property to get the vote. How did she feel when the vote came in? And how did other women... Now she was wealthy, but I don't think she owned property, did she? She was kind of a, a sponsored pauper to put it that way. I mean, she didn't own anything, actually. Her father, just a little bit of background if you hadn't heard me talking about it the last time, her father was the last Maharaja of Punjab and had been forced to sign over his kingdom as a small boy, including the Kohinoor diamond, which is now in the Tower of London. Should have crime tape around it. It does not. But anyway, her father had come to Britain and been sort of more or less adopted like a pet by Queen Victoria, and that's how Sophia had grown up as Queen Victoria's goddaughter. But she didn't have anything. Everything had been taken from her father. So the grace and favour house that she'd been given at Hampton Court was charity. The stipend that she had was charity. So, you know, to push back against the very people who could take all of that away from you tomorrow is a pretty brave thing mm -hmm. to do. She was also this sort of fantastically popular socialite. She was a fashion icon, straight model. 
women's magazines had just started to come out and, and they loved her for the first part of her life when she was really quite benign and pointless, actually quite a nightmare, I think. You know, she just used to go to parties, that's all she cared about. And they absolutely adored her. They didn't want, they wanted to wash the brownness off her because she had these two, you know, we talk about intersectionality these days. She was right there. She was an Indian. She was one of the only brown faces in the court. And she became this quite troublesome feminist as well. But when she was just being a good girl, when somebody Tony Robbins would have quite liked, um, they tried to wash the colour off her. So there was this magazine, The Church Times, that called her a thoroughly English gal, notwithstanding her great oriental name. And suddenly, they don't know what to do with her because she has this sort of Damascene conversion. She goes to India. She experiences racism for the very first time. You know, here, she's a celebrity. Everyone loves her. In India, she's just another coolie. You know, another brown face. They treat her abominably. And so she comes back with this fire rage in her stomach. And she hears all the nationalists in India demanding a voice in their future. All the Indians saying, you know what? Give us a voice in our future. Just give us a voice. And she comes back here and she hears the same thing coming from the mouths of the suffragettes. And she goes, right, you are my people now. And she risks everything for them. Mm. And she did risk everything, didn't she? And she had a lot but she basically said, what did make those women... Because Emmeline Pankhurst was wealthy as well. A lot of the suffragettes were. Did she lose it all? Like, no, well, she did, did at the end. I mean, at the end, it. right at the end of things. They couldn't take away her title. There are some lovely letters which I found. When she was at the height of her suffragette activity, she was a right royal pain in their bottoms. You know, she refused to pay taxes. They took her to court. She refused to pay the fines. She wouldn't sign the census papers. She just graffiti across it. You know, as women do not count, we shall not be counted. I have a conscientious objection to filling in this form. She led the Black Friday march, is something we talked about last time, which ended in appalling violence outside Westminster and was arrested, but then they let her go because to have women like her giving testimony in court was just too embarrassing, not just here, but in India, where they're trying to keep control of the natives. And here's a little tiny five foot one brown girl defying the British authorities. So she was like this little grenade that was going to go off in their faces. She had means. Emmeline had limited means. I mean, we, you say that she was wealthy, but a lot of these women were carried and buoyed by the donations of others. Mm. I mean, Emmeline was middle class, but not wealthy. She wasn't super wealthy. She wasn't super wealthy. But she wasn't poor either. She wasn't And poor. she could have just sort of had a nice life. She was an interior designer, wasn't she? Emily? She was. She liked, yes, I mean, you know, that's a very grand way of putting it. She kind of had a nice sensibility. She was sort of Paris educated and came back liking the finer things in life and fancied herself as a shop owner and stocked this shop in Russell Square. She had this dream of sort of coming back and selling beautiful things while her husband, who was a really radical liberal who uh, wanted to give Ireland home rule, wanted to abolish the House of Lords, you know, was a real radical thinker of his time. She wanted to have this beautiful shop where people could come and browse. She went bust twice, you know. She wasn't very good at it. She wasn't a very good, good saleswoman. And in the end, you know, women like her, there were, you know, some of the very wealthy women. There's a lot said about, you know, it was the folly of the rich. You know, there were rich women who indulged in the suffragette movement. They had platform. They had agency, and that's why they sort of were able to do the things that... But it's, a, it's a lot, isn't it, for someone like Princess Sophia, who was living in Queen Victoria... She was living in Hampton Court, wasn't Hampton she? Hampton Court, yeah. And as, as Queen Victoria's goddaughter, and for mm. Emmeline Pankhurst, who had a... And yes, OK, maybe her interior design store didn't work out the way mm. she wanted it to, but basically had a nice life. She had a roof go, over her head and some... some yeah, to go to prison like and mm. to starve. I just feel like I know myself, and I would try the hunger strike... But about four o'clock, I'd go, I think I'm more used to feminism mm. if I've had a sandwich. Mm. And I would just justify it. I don't know how they kept, How did they keep going? Well, they weren't just going hungry because, of course, the state responded with brutality that we would call torture. And we do call torture these yeah. days. They the force feeding they force fe force that them. happened. And, and one of the awful bits of doing research for a book like this is there are boxes and boxes of testimony from women who talk about what it was like to be force-fed. Sylvia Pankhurst writes very powerfully about it. And it's in terms of rape. There mm. are tubes which are pushed down your you. throat or the other way to try and get this disgusting, cloying liquid that they used to use. It was called Bengers. I mean, it's just awful. There are these little adverts and magazines. Bengers, if your child's not eating, have some Bengers, you know. It's this thing that's meant to carry all the nutrients. And they poured this stuff down women's throats. And they would throw them up and they would pour it again and throw it up 
pour it again. Mm. So women weren't just going hungry. You know, they were being lacerated. Their jaws were mm. almost broken. Well, yeah, a lot of them had yeah. terrible problems. Yeah, often, absolutely. Didn't they? How did women who didn't own property... Because, yes, all women got the vote 10 years later. Mm -hmm. But you didn't know that at the time. You never know if that's going to happen. There were a lot of working-class women who fought with the suffragettes. And even Princess Sophia, I imagine, because she didn't actually own property, wouldn't have got the vote. How did they feel when they saw rich women getting the vote or richer women, property owners, getting the vote? Were they devastated? There was certainly disappointment that they hadn't got everything. Did they feel betrayed they by wealthier women? No, I didn't get that sense. I certainly didn't get that sense because there were some very high-profile poorer women who were with the course. People like Annie Kenny, who was a, a mill worker, who was from front and centre in the suffragette movement. Annie was always organising and, you know, with her mill shawl over her head. And she never condemned the leadership when the, the partial vote was given to property owning women. Um, there was another fantastic woman called Emma Lloyd, Emma Sproson. I mean, what, what's sad is that sort of there aren't more faces in books like this or galleries like this. These are absolute superhero well, women. Well, presumably, if you're working class, you didn't have a lot of time for sit, having your portrait taken. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and nobody was interested in doing it. Yeah. Sadly, and nobody there was cared. Limited you know, Instagram. You then. had li <laughs> limited significance. As yes, the limited significance. Tone would have said, you know. But they didn't turn against the leadership. They were reassured that it's coming. It's coming. And they'd fought so hard and come so far, they believed it. So the leaders of the suffragette movement said to the working class women and the women who just didn't own property, we will continue we're, to fight. We're not going to let this So go. now we've got the mm. vote. It helps us mm. help all you, women you, get you, the vote you, you, or you, more you, women get the vote. Make the door slightly open and then the tidal wave comes through. So even the poorer were, suffragettes did celebrate in 1918? They did, yeah. I mean, there were suffragettes who felt let down by other things. I mean, there's a very famous case of Kitty Marion, who's... Um, was a really radical suffragette who objected completely to Emmeline's call to put down your rocks and stop the campaign because of the war. You know, when war was declared, Emmeline Panker said, we have got to get behind the war effort. And not only did she say that, she said, I will lead the campaign to raise money and get boys to be recruited, you know, and, and she was given money by the government to go and do this. And Kitty Marion said, that's not who I am. That's when she had German parentage. And she said, you are betraying me. And very volubly mm. said, you're betraying me. But from working class voices, there may be that they are there, but I haven't come across them. Last weekend, Steve Alley and I went to Calais and the situation there is really, really bad at the moment. There are children camping in the mud there's families over there who are really, really in desperate circumstances. And you've been just so amazing at the call for volunteering. Help Refugees told me pretty much all of the new volunteers that are going out there from the Guilty Feminist. We met somebody on the ferry called Katie, who was amazingly going over as a teacher for two weeks of her holiday. I can't just say enough how you're the best audience in the world for responding, leaving the house, heeding the call. We really, really desperately need donations right now. It's got to the situation where there's no more donations left to sort. And there are all sorts of things we need. Families out there, women, children, men who need tents. They need nappies. They need sleeping bags. They need women's products, all sorts of things that you can find on the list. Helprefugees.org forward slash Calais forward slash needs hyphen list. In the show notes, we will put how you can donate. You can donate through Leisure Fair, fair is spelled F-A-Y-R-E dot com. And you can also donate through their Amazon wish list. If you go to helprefugees.org, you'll be able to find all sorts of things. And if you email Calais donations at helprefugees.org, you can find your nearest drop-off point or you can donate funds directly to donate.helprefugees.org forward slash campaigns forward slash northern hyphen France forward slash. Please, 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 if you can possibly donate any of these things that you'll find on the list. And at the moment, they're in desperate need of men's shoes size 40 to 44, specifically 42, but 40, 42 or 44, lots of 42s we need, trainers and boots. The people we support out there get through shoes very quickly, living outside, running from the police with very changeable weather and our shoe stocks are desperately low. So anything at all that you can send, socks as well would be amazing. But please go to the list and find out what you can donate. 
and do donate something. You're the most responsive audience in the world, the most amazing listeners. And we really love you in the way that you respond. Thank you so much. Please spread the word on your own social media to try and get people who don't listen to the podcast to hear as well. It's amazing being out there. Anyone who can go out there and volunteer should do so uh, with Help Refugees. And we're hoping to have news of more events out soon. Thank you so, so much. And... Okay, so I've had a really good couple of weeks. I just got back from Australia. It was so sunny there. I was in Adelaide, and I had a bike while I was out there. And I went riding one day down this beautiful bike path. It was all shady, and I rode out to the sea. And then I got there, and I took off all my riding gear, and I just laid on the beach in my bikini. And then when it was time to go back, all my riding gear was so sweaty. I was like, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just ride back in my bikini because it's along a bike path and it's kind of private, it's no big deal. And I forgot that I'd eventually get off the bike path and then I was just riding on my bike in a bikini in the middle of the city. (laughs) And like, for the listeners at home, I have bright pink hair and I'm covered in tattoos. I look like a DC comic villain who's gone green for transport. Like, and just to know about my bikini aesthetic. It's less of a bikini. It's more of three strings attached together by two sequins. Like, (laughs) it is a strong look. Like, I don't hang out with catty women, but if I did, they'd say things to me like, I love how you'll just wear anything. Like, they're small (laughs) bikini. They're so small that when people do see me in them, they think to myself, I don't have the confidence to wear that, but good for her. Like, (laughs) small bikinis. And and the thing is, is if you are a small woman on a bike in a bikini in the middle of the city, there's something sweet about that. It's almost like Parisian cinema, you know? <laughs> like, everyone looks at that and they're like, oh, a manic pixie dream girl. Ah. <laughs> but if you are a full-figured woman on a bike in a bikini in the middle of a city, it's a political statement. <laughs> Like, I rode by, and people were like, this is hashtagable. <laughs> and the thing about it is, is I have been sm- a little smaller than I am now. I've been a little bigger than I am now. But I have always been a curvy woman. And I am just tired of being an inspiration to everyone. <laughs> like, it is getting exhausting. I rode by, people applauded. Like, is it... I've always kind of been like this. I've always had uh, been unabashedly confident to the point where, like, you know, wherever you work, if you've ever found yourself at an event or in a room with people who have achieved a lot in your field, like the esteemed colleagues, and have you ever felt that moment of like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? I've never felt that. I'm always like, finally, I'm among my people. Like Lady Gaga, I was born this way. Because when I was told I was going to be on The Guilty Feminist, I did uh, exactly what everyone else does. I called my mother. And, uh, and she told me, she was like, one time when you were 12, you pulled me into the bathroom when I was having one of those days where I just didn't feel pretty. And you told me, you go, mom, this is what I do every morning. I go, look at this face, look at this face. Flawless. And that's how. <laughs> that's what I did. That's what I did. And like, I know it's hard to believe looking at me, but I dye my hair. And uh, I'm naturally dark blonde. And as a child, as a blonde white child, I always thought I looked like Barbie until everyone told me I didn't. (laughs) And even now when people are like, her measurements are unattainable, she wouldn't even be able to stand upright. Even now I'm still like, yeah, but I definitely look like Barbie. (laughs) 
and with confidence, sometimes it has like it hasn't always worked for me. I have had moments, even as a young person, when I was knocked back. Like I didn't make show choir in high school, which, if you don't know anything about American high school, uh, show choir is where the coolest nerds get to hang out. <laughs> and I never made show choir, and I tried out every year, and I never made it, and I was devastated every fucking time. And now I'm the only one from my graduating class in show business. So, ha, 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 I win. (laughs) But the reason why I bring up confidence is the theme of this is pushing back. And there's several ways that we can push back. There's times when we've band together and we've done marches or the Me Too movement, which is totally awesome. There's also ways in your own life you can push back. And there's a very simple way of just being unabashedly confident. Because one confident woman is inspiring. When Jennifer Lawrence insisted on getting paid as much as her male co-stars, that was inspiring. We see it in our own lives. My mom, again, when I was talking to her on the phone, she said when she had my brother, my younger brother, she had him via C-section. My father is a doctor. Our GP who delivered all of us is also our neighbor. We're all friends. So when they were deciding what day to have the C-section. My father and Dr. Emil had that entire conversation in front of my mother like she wasn't there. They were like, well, you know, we could, no, we can't do it on Tuesday because that's golf night. And uh, so we should probably, we should probably do it on a Monday. Let's do it on the 13th. That's, yes, that's my wife's birthday. Let's do it on, we'll do the C-section on the 13th. That sounds great. And they had the entire conversation and my mother just looked at him and goes, we'll have the C-section on the 17th. Because she wasn't going to decide when people were going to cut out her stomach and rip her baby out. And now my brother's birthday is July 17th. Send him a message. (laughs) But a lot of people have trouble finding confidence within themselves. It's hard. I've had my own wobbles with it because, you know, I've read things. And, like, even when I became a yoga instructor when I was 23, I desperately wanted to be thin. That was a thing that I wanted. And I lost all my confidence in my body and what my body could do. And I specifically wanted to look like my fellow yoga instructor, Kyoko Katsuru. And I would tell people, I'd be like, I want to look like Kyoko Katsuru. And finally, a friend pulled me aside and was like, Abigail, you need to think about this. Because Kyoko is Japanese and a former Olympic gymnast. (laughs) You were born and raised in Ohio and fed exclusively corn and pork until you were 20. You will never be the size of your own thigh. And now, of course, I see the sense in that. And now when I look down, I'm like, yeah, walking around on two Japanese women every day. (laughs) Yeah. Two Japanese women better than one. But if you've ever had that moment where you've dipped in confidence, I've come up with three ways to be confident actions that you can do in your everyday life. One, simply say what you want. Never apologize beforehand. There's a big thing that people do. They go, oh, I'm sorry. I was just thinking that maybe we could do. No, just say it. And as an American who lives in Britain now, if you walk in and just say what you want and don't apologize, British people can't handle that. (laughs) Like, I got into the clubs quite early here, and all my friends were like, how did you do it? Because I call people and be like, hi, I'd like to play your club. I'm free next weekend. And they go, oh, well, sorry. Here's the thing. Uh, We're full this weekend. I'm like, great, next weekend. I'll be in next weekend. No problem. And they'll be like, oh, no, uh, we're full next weekend. In fact, we're full for four months. So sorry. And I'm like, great, I'll be in on the first weekend of the fifth month. I'll see you there. And they're like, oh, shit. (laughs) Like they, they just just say what you want and you will get it. Secondly, there's a lot of writing out there that's like how to be a confident woman and get the body you want. Just take that part off. Just love the body you're in, yes? Because even if you want to change, if you want to be able to lift more weights, if you want to be able to touch your toes, if you want to run three miles without stopping, if you want to do those things, it's a lot easier if you like the body you're in to enjoy those things with. Imagine doing a project with someone you hate. 
you get the project done and afterwards you're just relieved it's over and you had no fun. Imagine doing a project with someone you like. You had a great time, you can't wait to work together again. Treat your body like a friend that you want to do things with. And thank you. The third one, and I leave you with this, is simply know your worth. A lot of times when we go into uh, meetings or we have certain opportunities, our heads start to click over on all of the reasons why we might not get this opportunity. You are in that room because of something you've done, because of your, the education you have, because of some achievement you've made. Always remember that. For me personally, I have counted every stand-up set I have done since I've started. So today, right now, this is my 2,000th, 235th time doing stand-up comedy. So, whenever I get nervous about doing my job, which is this, I know in my head I've done it over 2,000 times. And even if I met with an audience, who doesn't necessarily like my comedy, I know over half of these times I was funny, otherwise this wouldn't be my job. So if you didn't laugh, you're wrong. <laughs> Thank you, I've been out of the line. Did you, I just need to ask, normally I would go straight on, but I really do have to ask, as a small child, did you really take your mother into the bathroom and when she was feeling down and school her and say, Every morning, I look into the mirror and go, look at this face, look at this face, flawless. Yeah, yeah. Are you bet Midler as a child? <laughs> uh, my, uh, my, uh, she was uh, one of my big role models. But I think I, it was also because... Uh, flawless, it's just the word flawless coming from a child. Well, look at this face, look at this face, flawless. Well, it sounds like, like a 65-year-old woman from Florida. I think it's because I really like the TV show Will and Grace. Oh. And that's how... Uh, you were a child when Will and Grace was on? I was like 11 or 12 when it right. came out. And then I got to grow up with it. So, yay. That's how they talked. Oh, like so that's you talked like that so as a So I was just like, I was like, <laughs> Abigail with an A, because Abigail with an A goes, ah, nah, eh. Like, I was just like trying, <laughs> which he stole from Liza with a Z, because Liza with a Z goes, this is nuts. And, uh, guys, this is getting very niche very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I just wanted to be like them, so that's how I started talking. Ha that's amazing. That's amazing. I just love the idea of you as a kid <laughs> saying to your mother, these are my daily... <laughs> My daily mantras. Yeah. Look at this face. Look at this face. Flawless. I feel like we need it on a t-shirt. Yeah. Like we feel like. I, I, I think we should all, as this audience, for the next week, every morning, say that in the mirror, and then hashtag, look at this face on Instagram and Twitter. Copy Abigail and tell her how it's going. Yeah. And copy the guilty feminist and tell us if it's making you feel better. Like every time you feel down, you just find a mirror. Look at this face. Look at this face. Flawless. Uh, I'm so going to try it. Yeah. Oh, please do. I still do it sometimes. I'll be honest. When affirmations became a thing, I was so annoyed because I was like, I've been doing this since I was 12. And oh. I never, I never jumped on that. You didn't realize that's what you were doing? No, I had no idea. Oh, you'd made up. I, I thought I invented it. That's amazing. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, it's a question about your book. Um, from when you first decided to write it to when you completed it, what was the thing that you never expected to learn or find out that really kind of shocked you at the time and that you're so kind of grateful that you went through the process? Ooh, good question. Um, good question. We should have asked that. Well, yes. it was... <laughs> I was going to. But... Uh, yeah, me too. Yeah. It's sort of something, it reminded me when Abigail I was talking about Rosalind Franklin and the DNA discovery, and there's another woman here in this book as well from the portrait gallery, Jocelyn Bell Bernal, who discovered pulsars. This week it seems most potent because Mo Molin seems to have been deleted out of all of the celebrations of the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, I, I just can't believe how easy it is to delete women. And that was the first thing that I sort of realised when I was going through the book and I was finding these women who were extraordinary, who I'd never heard of. Indeed, you know, Sophia, who I should have known about but never heard of, is how easy it is for these great women to fall through the cracks. Now, sometimes it's sort of accidents of 
history and if they are not very good at blowing their own trumpets, Sophia was terrible at it. She was asked for an entry for who's who and, you know, some of these blue blood aristocrats who you told your niece not to marry, you know, they bang on and on and on about how brilliant they are. All she said was um, interest, the advancement of women. That's all she wanted to say. So she didn't really push herself forward. But others try to rob people of their credit. So Marie Curie, you've probably all heard of Marie Curie. Mm -hmm. When Marie Curie discovered radium, do you know what the British newspapers said? They said, hooray for Pierre Curie, her husband. What? Oh, I didn't Pierre know that. Curie has discovered, and it ran in the front pages. And one of the women who I particularly love, I mean, things that I found surprising, is how easy that happened. But then the pushback that we're talking about. It's kind of similar to that Tony Robbins pushback. Because one particular woman, Hertha Ayrton, now you probably haven't heard her name, but please remember it now. She was the first woman to be allowed into the Institute of Electrical Engineers, which in itself is pretty brilliant. But she made it her life's cause to crush any editor who said Pierre Curie had made that discovery. Uh. (laughs) She went after them and after them and after them because she said, one lie told about a woman has more lives than a cat. And it's thanks to Hertha Ayrton and her bloody-minded doggedness that that started changing and suddenly Marie Curie got the credit she deserved. Wow, Did so we would have thought that was Pierre Curie if it well, wasn't Well, you know, yeah, I'm sure Possibly. at some Certainly point would have there been may the... have been a fact check, but, you know, that's what the newspapers... <laughs> did did yeah. Marie Curie, did she fight for it herself? Was no, she like, excuse was me, that... guys, uh, nah, nah, it was me. No, I mean, she, they, they worked together. Mar- yeah, I mean, yeah. Pierre Curie said it was her. You know, oh, yeah. Saying it. But, but the newspapers were still... Jocelyn Belvanel, when she discovered the Pulsar, which are, you know, they're beautiful things. I'm very fond of her because she is a consummate... I've got a thing about scientists. I'm married to a scientist. And actually, she gave my husband his honorary doctorate. So I really like her. Um, but when she discovered it, she'd written this paper and she was so young. I think she was just a postdoc when she did it. You know, she had her name on the research paper, but it was her supervisor and another researcher who went on to get the Nobel Prize for it that year. And that's not that long ago, I believe, not 1974, I think. No. What page is she on? I want to see her. She's 137. When you think how recent a lot of this is, when people say, oh, well, we've got equality now, you go, it's implausible we have equality now because of how recent, how could we possibly have caught up? And I was reading about... Do you know the boxer, Nicola Adams? Yeah. Yeah. She's currently the gold medalist in the women's flyweight division for the Olympics, but also she is the reigning Olympic World Commonwealth Games and European Games champion at her weight. I mean, that's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. When she was born, there was no women's boxing. So she was, in fact, the first woman to win an Olympic uh, medal for England. She was born in 1982, Mm. Like, she wasn't bought... Well, when she was born, women couldn't box. And you think, well, that's got to be 1955, right? It's around there, around there. No, 1982. Mm. So we have hardly been in the race for significance, actually. And even the women who had the headlines. I mean, Mo Molan, I'm still really angry about You really that. are angry I really about Mo Molan. I really we am We should do an episode about, about Mo, Mo I Molan. So. I yeah. think so. Because, you know, you talk to the people... I'm, I'm a political journalist, so I, I did sort of do bits in Belfast... And I spoke to people who were at meetings where there's this wonderful story where she got so angry with the people sitting around her and she was having chemo treatment at the time that she took off her wig and threw it at one of them. Yay! Wow! <laughs> You've got to love Mo Mola. You just... But you, yeah, but how easy it is to delete people, that's what I it's find. It's too clever. easy. Well, we are delighted that the National Portrait Gallery is not deleting these women or allowing these women to be deleted. So please get your copy of 100 Pioneer women it's only 7.95 and you can get it on the way out in the shop but you can also buy an Easter announced book on princess sophia on the way out in the gift shop so exit through the gift shop <laughs> uh, if you're listening at home fiona how can you buy 100 pioneering women you can buy it via the website. and that is um, okay so it's www.npg.org Dot UK. And you can go there and buy 100 pioneering women. And they're really inspirational. I think it's a really nice thing in the morning. These little blurbs, just look at their face, look at their fabulous face and a beautiful piece of art. Read the blurb and then look in the mirror and go, look at this face, look at this face, flawless. <laughs> Do 
read Anita Rao's book on Princess of Fire as well this year while we're in the centenary. It's a beautiful book and it's an inspiration to see a woman of colour who defied the British system. It will inspire you. We don't have enough uh, information about women of colour who were suffragettes and a lot of them were excluded. So it's really brilliant to focus and give voice to those who were there. And in fact, uh, support Suffragettan, our hip hop musical in which women of colour have taken the narrative back of the suffragettes. And that will be coming to very many Guilty Feminist shows soon. And hopefully there will be a full length musical at some point in the next year or so. So if you're listening at home, go to guiltyfeminist.com and there will be instructions as to how to donate and chip in to Suffragettan. Because we do need to pay the women who are doing it. Otherwise, it's not feminism. (laughs) Abigailia, did you have anything you'd like to plug? I uh, have a website with uh, all my gigs on it, abigailia.com. I will be at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival this year doing a show at 9 p.m. at the Underbelly called Do You Know Who I Think I Am? Uh, uh, oh, good. You do. Uh, and uh, I am on uh, Twitter at Abigailia. I'm on Instagram at Namaste Bitches Podcast. Uh, <laughs> But if you do seriously try to do the look at this face, look at this face flawless thing, and I do recommend it because it's ridiculous. Uh, you can't say it like that, though. You can't say, look at this face. Look at this face. Just say it the way you said it the Sorry. first time. Look at this face. Look at this face. Flawless. That's how it is. <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a gesture. Yeah. Do, okay, you so got to do the head pop. If you're you listening at home, it's look at this face, look at this face. You circle your face with your finger, with the pointer finger, and then flawless... It's like you release the hand like a firework and you tip the face back. False! It's a jazz hand and a head pop. Okay, great. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> but if you... <laughs> if you, you do, do how it... How did you get passed over for show choir? I, I really... I, I mean... It was, it's an absolute travesty. I, I, well, uh, t- let's take it up with Michelle Smith, uh, my choir director. <laughs> but uh, she's lovely. Uh, but uh, no, if you do do it, uh, please reach out to me and let me know how it goes. And you are at Abigail. At Abigail on Twitter. Can yeah. you please spell Abigail? A B I G O L I A H. Great. Ah, Abigail. Oh. Great. <laughs> it's phonetic. <laughs> And, Anita, do you have anything to... Oh, just one thing to look out for. So this week I've been with some brilliant women judging the Women's Prize for Fiction. The shortlist is coming out very soon. Support those books and support those authors. They are quite magnificent. Wonderful. That is lovely. And support Anita's writing and especially by her book. You can also keep track of everything we've been up to. Uh, You can follow The Guilty Feminist on Instagram, uh, Twitter... Etc. And if you could go to Apple Podcasts and rate, review, and subscribe, ideally with five shiny stars, it will help other people to find the podcast. And if you've just, you've, you might have rated it once, you think I've rated it, it's done. No, you can rate every episode, gang. <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host, Abigail Archibald, and our very special guest, Anita Anand. The recording and was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Todd. The producer was Tom Zalitsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Fiona, Mark Todd, and everyone at the National Corporate Gallery, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit theguiltyfeminist.com. Just because I like the mic to come out so I can sit in the chair and see both people. And at the moment, it's really pulling. And I'm going to be sitting like this, and I'm not going to be able to see anybody. So is there any way we could adjust the mic? Thank you. Well. Health and safety. I like that it's health and safety, but I don't think any bad thing's going to happen if I can sit back in my chair. <laughs> I know, I do say that now, and I will say it later when nothing happens. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much. A man has fixed it. Okay. Um, All right, so we should do our um, opening.